All right. So, uh, a couple things. Uh, we're not going to have clickers today. That is just because I realize I have one fewer USB port than I need. So, uh, we will do clickers again next week, and I will bring an extra USB port for that. Um, a couple of other announcements that I want to make to you all is that don't forget assignment zero is due very, very soon. And if you have not seen this, it's on the course website. Uh, all of our assignments are publicly available on the course website. Uh, it's important that you do A0 and get it correct because if you do not get it correct and submit it, any assignment uh, that is due afterwards but before you've submitted A0, you don't get any marks for. So if you don't submit A0 until the end of January, then A1 and A2's grade, you can kiss goodbye. Uh, so get it done now. There's no reason for you to lose marks. It doesn't actually require any thought. It's like put your name on it, agree not to cheat, tell us what program you're in, and register your clicker. Uh, now I know some of you may be of this mindset, I don't care about my 5% participation score, so I'm not going to buy a clicker. And I can appreciate where you're coming from. I get it. Uh, if you decide to be one of those people who does not want to purchase a clicker and you're going to kiss that participation grade goodbye, you may have a difficult time doing assignment zero since part of it is register your clicker. If that is you and you really aren't going to buy a clicker for this course, please let us know right away and uh, we'll discuss things. Yeah? Uh, can you use the app? Can you use the app like on your phone? My understanding is no. Unfortunately, I think the clicker bases that we actually have don't support it. Because I think they've been around for the last 10 years. <laughs> I will double check with IST to see if that can be used. Because I'd much rather you got everybody. Does anyone in here not own a cell phone? <laughs> I'll check. I'll check. Because that's, is it free, I think, for the app, probably? Yeah, we'll see. If we can make that work, I'll make it work. But I can't promise. <laughs> All right, uh, the other thing I want to say is assignment one is also released and uh, you should get a start on it. At the end of today's lecture, you will be able to complete assignment one. Um, and in general, we're going to make sure that you have enough time between when the material is actually taught versus when the assignment is due such that you can actually complete the assignment in a reasonable amount of time and you're not trying to do the assignment with material you just learned that day and the assignment's due tomorrow because that's not really fair to you. All right, now one quick note, you'll notice we do actually have the camera here today because everybody essentially voted yes, you do want to stream. It is being live streamed right now to Twitch. It's going over wireless, unfortunately, so it could be a little buggy. Um, I need to get an Ethernet cable installed in here before that'll pick up. The, the Twitch lectures will also be uploaded to YouTube, and I'll post all the information for that uh, to Piazza. But if you are looking on Twitch, my username on Twitch is the same as my username at the university. So there you go. That's my Twitch ID. And I'll post the uh, YouTube location as well, so, yeah. And if you're here in this room right now and you're like, I'm gonna watch it on Twitch in the room where it's streaming from, please don't. There is a limited amount of Wi-Fi bandwidth around here and I'm trying to use it to upload. So if you're taking it all for downloading it when I'm right in front of you, please don't do that. All right, that being said, I'm not expecting anybody watching today. So last class was all that boring administrative stuff. And I want to apologize in advance for those of you who have already taken this course before, for those of you who have programming experience outside of this course, the first week or two is going to be so boring, you're going to want to put your head in a blender. Please don't do that. Um, bear with us. We have designed this course such that it is approachable even for individuals who have never touched a line of code in their life. 
And so there's a few things we have to get out of the way with before we can actually get down to some real problem solving. Um, that being said, if you're in that boat and you're bored to tears, things that you can do are go ahead and do the assignments in class. Um, other things that you can do is just practice coding in general or sleep, play games quietly, I don't care, whatever you want. For the record, in the rare chances where I did go to class as an undergrad, I drew. That's just what I did. There's a question at the back. Yeah. Are these slides available? These slides are available online on the course website, so you don't need to be enrolled in the course. They're public. Yeah. We don't really hide anything here in CS. <laughs> All right. We did start talking last class about what a functional language is and how functional languages are very math-like. And Racket, of course, is a functional language, and that is the language that you are going to be using. And when we're dealing with functions, there are three things. We actually have the values, which in math are always numbers. Well, in Racket, it's not going to be just numbers, because if all of our programming was done with numbers, well, that would be kind of boring, um, because nobody wants to be referred to by a number. You'd rather be referred to by your name, even if your computer would prefer the number. Um, so in Racket, values are numbers. There are integers. There are rational and irrational numbers. So that means you can do decimal numbers as well. Um, in addition to numbers, there are also symbols, booleans, strings, lists. There's all different kinds of values in Racket. Uh, and this is true for most languages. Now, one of the interesting quirks about Racket that I briefly mentioned last class, and this is especially important if you have written code in another language like C, C++, Turing, Java, or anything like that, Racket does not have a maximum or minimum integer. Technically speaking, there's no boundary. However, there is a real bound based on your system's resources. So theoretically, Racket has no max and min int, but your computer only has so much memory, and so it can only actually store a number so big. So, and that really depends on your individual computer and the state of your system. So, from our perspective, you can say there's no max and min int. Rational numbers will be represented exactly, that is with no rounding, and any irrational number, or any time you see this pound i, that means it is an inexact representation. What that means is that this number has been truncated or rounded. And you should be quite cautious about using them because if you are going to repeatedly use the same inexact number in an equation like 10 times, each time that little bit of rounding is gonna add up and you go from being off by a millimeter to being off by a kilometer. And you don't want that to happen. So try to avoid using inexacts whenever possible. That being said, some of your assignments will use inexact numbers, and that's okay. Now, the other two things we have are expressions. That's just values relating to each other by some operator. And then the last thing we have is functions. So that is, of course, the generalization of an expression. And if you've done any math before, you know all this, and it's really boring. Now, when we have a function... We have some name, and it takes some number of parameters, and then in the body of the function, the expression, we use the parameters as placeholders. And what we're going to end up doing is when we want to evaluate this function, we are applying the function to some arguments. So I have function g, and I'm going to apply it with arguments one and three. And what ends up happening is the placeholders x and y get filled in by the <coughs> argument values. So one gets substituted wherever x is, and the three gets substituted wherever y is. I know it's boring. Now, something else that's interesting, and maybe it's not something you did so much in math class, but it is definitely something we do in computer programming, is we often have the arguments of functions be other functions it's themselves. So we can actually apply g, and our arguments might be other function calls. That's kind of useful. Now, the care, the thing that we need to pay attention to is what do you do in that case? How do you actually evaluate the function? As it turns out, in mathematics, it doesn't matter what order you evaluate this in. 
And we evaluate by substitution. And we could, if we wanted to, evaluate f of 3 before g of 1, 3. Or we can actually evaluate this outer g and pass these right through and end up with g of 1, 3 plus f of 3. It doesn't matter in mathematics what order we do the evaluation in. Um, in this particular case, we've chosen to evaluate our arguments first, starting in a leftmost innermost fashion. So we, um, we're going to simplify this one. And then once we have a value that is a simple number, then we evaluate the other parameter. And then once we have just a function being applied to pure values, then we'll actually evaluate that function. And the way that we have evaluated here is actually the way that bracket is evaluated. And it has a name. It's called the canonical form. And we always evaluate leftmost innermost with the canonical evaluation. And it is important that when you are doing bracket on a piece of paper, and by the way, we are going to ask you to do this on a piece of paper. We are absolutely on your exam going to ask you to be the computer and run a racket program on paper because it's math and you can do that. You need to make sure that you use the canonical form because unlike with mathematics where the order of evaluation doesn't matter, it does matter with programming. And so racket uses the canonical form. And that way, every time I apply a function, I know I'm always going to get uh, the expected result. So as I said, always leftmost, innermost. One other thing with brackets. Brackets requires that before you can apply a function, the parameters, the arguments, actually have to be values. So if you have a function g and you pass to it f of 7, bracket must evaluate that parameter and turn it into a value before it can evaluate g. We always simplify the arguments to values first. And if you've ever done Haskell programming, you'll note that that is very different from what Haskell does. Haskell is what's known as a lazy evaluator language, and it only evaluates the parameters when it absolutely has to. Haskell's a little weird. Fun, though. All right. Now, something else that we take advantage of in mathematics is, of course, there's, you know, Benmus or Pedmus, whatever they call it these days. It was Benmus when I was a, a kid. And that is certain operators have a certain precedence. And sometimes, to make sure that we have the order of operations uh, always being evaluated in the order that we actually want, we add extra brackets. So we could have this function here just 6 minus 4 divided by 5 plus 7 without the brackets. And if I did that, then I would end up doing 4 divided by 5 and then 6 minus that value plus 7. And that actually ends up giving us a very different result a lot of the time than if I have the brackets in place. So we often add brackets to make it very clear as to what order of operations this has to be evaluated in. And when we're talking about programming, if you are using C or C++ or Java or Turing or anything other than Racket, it's absolutely critical from both the readability and for the compiler, which actually lets, turns the code into something the machine can run, that you put the brackets in so it knows what order you want things to be evaluated in. You don't need to worry about this in Racket. I'm going to show you why you don't need to worry about these extra brackets in racket. So you can actually think about the expressions that we're using themselves. So if I have uh, plus and minus and things like that, these are actually known as infix operators. That is, we have argument, operator, argument. We read it left to right, just like we would read any English text. But realistically, those operators could be treated as named functions. And if I were to treat plus or minus or multiply or divide as a function, I could rewrite it as operator being 
and there's its arguments. So 3 minus 2, well, if minus is the function I'm applying, well, I do minus because that's the name of the function, and then in brackets, the arguments, the parameters I am passing to the minus function. So 3 minus 2 is written in infix notation, but minus 3, 2 is written in what's known as postfix notation. And what's really interesting about postfix notation is all of those brackets that we were using to specify the order of operations, we don't need them anymore. You can get rid of them. They're totally unnecessary. The only thing you need brackets for now is for the actual function application itself. Now you might be thinking, who uses this postfix? Why do I even care about this? Uh, bracket, by the way, is all postfix. Every expression you will write in racket is given in postfix order. Operator first, followed by a list of the parameters. Now, does anything other than racket use postfix notation? Obviously. Scheme and list, being the parent and grandparent of racket, are going to use postfix notation. But another thing that uses postfix notation is an old calculator that when I was an undergrad, people used a lot called BC. Um, and it's an old Unix command line thing, but it also used postfix notation. Um, and I think you can even still buy calculators these days that actually use postfix as well. It's pretty rare. It is going to take you some time to get used to this, to seeing the operator first followed by the parameters, but you'll get used to it, I'm sure. All right. Now, how do I take this then and turn it into racket code? All we have to do is move one bracket, and this becomes completely valid racket code. So to do that, I'm going to take the operator and put it inside, and we're done. So now, inside, if I had this equation from before, 6 minus 4 divided by 5 plus 7, instead of having the operator on the outside of the opening bracket, like calling f of x, <coughs> now I just move the f to the inside. So inside our opening bracket, that's where our function or operator is, followed by a list of the parameters. The parameters in racket are separated by spaces, not commas. If you put a comma, it's going to be confused and throw an error message. So why don't we take a look at this? Why don't we actually run some of these? So I'm going to switch over to racket here. And if you just want to evaluate some expression like this in Racket, you can use the runtime window at the bottom. This is where you can actually invoke functions and do expression evaluation and so on. So down here, let's just add some code. So I can do add 3 plus 2. What you can see here is my function, this is in postfix order. The function or operator is the first thing we have followed by a list of the parameters separated by spaces. And when I push enter, I should anticipate that the answer is 5. Which of course it is, by the way. And if it wasn't, we'd have um, a problem, <laughs> obviously. Now we can build these up. And we can nest them and nest them and keep nesting them. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, what if I really want to still use extra brackets to really make sure that this is evaluated in the way I want it to be evaluated? Don't do it. Racket will scream at you. It doesn't like it. You want some proof? Let's do it. So in our minds, this should evaluate to 3. But Racket's going to tell you, expected a function call. Racket's note syntax, that is the way it expects its code to be written, is immediately following the open bracket. There should be either an operator or a function. And the number 2 is not a function. I cannot to myself. 
I cannot to a chair. That doesn't make any sense. To is not a function. So do not, no matter how tempting it is, add any extra brackets and racket. Just don't do it. You'll have a bad time. By the way, racket does give you errors every time you do something bad with the syntax. Um, most of the time, the error messages that uh, Dr. Racket gives you are fairly straightforward to understand. That's not always the case. If you ever encounter an error message that you don't understand, by all means, post the error message to Piazza and your code privately, and we will take a look at it, or come see one of us during office hours. All right, any questions about how we write expressions with Racket? All right. If you'd like to get some practice doing this, and I highly recommend that you do, especially if you are new to writing code, um, find a math textbook and open it up usually to like the back page. I know like the uh, calc textbook that I have from my undergrad, the back few pages are all the calculus formulas. If you've got a physics textbook, it may be the same. Open it up to a page of formulas and turn them all into racket expressions. Now, you don't quite have everything you need to do that yet, but we will uh, very, very shortly. All right, so let's go back then. So, I've said this a few times. Racket is based, and functional languages are actually based on mathematics. And the name for that formal mathematics is actually called Lambda Calculus, which you can learn more about in CS145 or CS442. Um, what you can actually do with a functional language is because it is evaluated like math, because it is math, you can actually run every single racket program you write on a piece of paper. And that's kind of neat. And um, I should also warn you, we are absolutely going to ask you to do that on exams. So do get some practice with this. So if I have this expression here, I have, I'm multiplying 6 minus 4 by 3 plus 2, how would Racket actually evaluate this? And this is what's going on in Racket when you push enter. So the first thing it's going to do is it looks at the function. We always do left most first. So we have multiply function. Racket's then going to look at the arguments supplied to the multiply function. And Racket requires that the arguments of a function are values before it can be applied. And so when Racket looks at the arguments to the multiply function, it will see that they are not values. They are expressions. And so Racket is going to need to evaluate them. Now it has a choice. It can evaluate 6 minus 4, or it can do 3 plus 2. Canonical form indicates left most innermost. So we are going to evaluate 6 minus 4 first. Now in math, as you are simplifying the equation, you would normally use an equal sign. In this course, we are not using an equal sign. We are going to use the yields arrow. And when it comes to writing this stuff on an exam, do not use an equal sign. That's going to cause you to lose marks for no reason. Remember, I mentioned a lot of marks in this course are dedicated to you obeying the style that we have provided you. Don't lose those marks unnecessarily. So we are saying this, if we evaluate just one step, yields, we've evaluated our leftmost innermost, so that argument is now simplified to 2. And now Racket sees that 3 plus 2 needs to be evaluated. And so in the next, we will evaluate one more step. And we end up with 5. Well, now both of the arguments to multiply are values, so we can finally apply multiply. And we end up yielding the answer 10. When you are, this is called stepping. And when we ask you to do a stepping problem, don't skip any steps. One per line. If you are looking for practice with stepping problems, we will be giving you sample problems throughout the course slides. Uh, there are examples on the course website where you can actually do them interactively in a little applet, and it will check to make sure that you've done them correctly. 
Uh, and we will also ask you to do them on things like assignments and so on. Um, I will also make sure that I post some extra sample problems to Piazza because this is something that I feel like it should be easy marks. Should be easy marks. So we'll make sure that you get lots of practice with that. All right. Any questions about this evaluation? All right. So what kind of functions do we have in Racket? Well, obviously we have the basic arithmetic operators, plus, minus, divide, multiply. There are also lots of other built-in functions with Racket. Now, this says you should go to the textbook and... You should go to the Racket website and read their documentation, because that's a complete list. Um, and Dr. Rackett also has a wonderful page that will be divided according to the language level. I'll post some links to these to Piazza because those are your best resources. Um, the Rackett specification in particular will not only tell you all of the functions that are available to you, but how to use them, how they work, and what kind of output to expect, what kind of parameters can you and can you not expect them to work on. So I'll post a link to that. It's good reading. Make sure, however, that you only use functions that are available to your language level for the assignment. And that's where the Dr. Racket uh, help will actually come in handy as well. And I'll post a link to that too. So we have plus, minus, and all of that. We also have any kind of math a function that you expect. You know, ABS is for absolute. EXPT is for exponents, so that would give us x to the power of y. Uh, there's SQR for square. Let's actually just switch over to racket here. So uh, we can do SQR 2, and that gives us 4. We also have square root. Now let's be more fun. Let's do a negative number. Look at how nice. Look. It's beautiful, right? One of the nice things about Racket is its responses for things like imaginary numbers are super friendly. Let me tell you this, C is not that friendly. It's really not. So we have square root and it understands imaginary numbers. We also have functions like max and min, sine and cos, all kinds of math functions that you would expect. Now, one of the things that you may not be anticipating is the fact that some of these math functions, while in the real math world only take two arguments, in Racket can actually take as many as you want to pass them. And one of those is add. So we think of add as being, oh, I have to add one plus two. And Racket says, well, yeah, you can add some more. So you can actually have pretty much as many arguments to this as you want. So functions like add, you can have as many things as you want. That's really nice. Really nice. Because if you weren't able to do that, and you, let's say you had to add 10 things together, then you would end up with something that looks like this. Plus, 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 oh, I don't want to write that. And then at the very end, you've got to make sure that you've got however many bracket, end brackets that you have to make it actually match up. By the way, if you're going on Stack Overflow and you're like, what does everybody think of the Racket programming language? Programmers who have experienced it before, they'll be like, that's the language with a lot of brackets, right? Yeah. Make sure your brackets are balanced, by the way. It's friendly, though. Look, Racket's hugging everything. It says, I love your code. Yes. So if we give you a stepping problem on a midterm, yeah, do you want to just do it in one step? With a bunch of addition like that. Oh, with a bunch of addition like that? Yeah, you can do that one step. Yeah. Um, because that is one function being applied to some number of arguments. Um, whereas if we had a bunch of nested adds, then you would have to do it step by step by step. That's a good exam question. <laughs> Let me tell you, the best exam questions I ever get are always from students, like thinking of some creative, weird thing. And it's like, they always give it to me after I've written the exam. I'm like, damn, that would have been such a good question. Why didn't I think of it? Of course, they're thankful because it is a weird. All right. So 
Another function that takes multiple parameters uh, is max and min. So we can do like max of whatever we want. And all of that stuff is built in and super useful. All right, any questions about these basic functions? A couple more that I want to show you because they're pretty valuable are uh, when you're dividing things, uh, we usually just use the divide operator and we deal with the fact that we just get a decimal number in return. What if you don't want the decimal number? What if you actually want like the quotient and the remainder? Uh, Racket, by the way, actually has quotient and remainder built in. So we can actually type quotient and hopefully I spell this properly. <laughs> so we have quotient and we also have remainder. So they're all, those are two very, very useful functions you will find uh, as well. All right. So this is where I go on a bit of a rant about stuff, rant warning. Um, while this course is not about programming, this course is about how do we actually solve problems, how do we do, how do we communicate about problems, uh, inevitably all of your assignments are writing code and you are going to learn about writing code uh, in this course. Now, one of the things, I, I've been working with programs for a very, very long time. I think I may have written my first computer program in... I want to say 1994, and it was in BASIC. Um, it's really important when you are working with your program that when there is an error in the program, you can find it. And we call that process debugging. And the world's best programmers are also expert debuggers. They can take anybody's code and they can find the bug. And if you are an expert debugger, it means you really understand how to program because you know how it works. So you know how to find the bugs. Now, this is not traditionally a part of this course, but this is something I am adding because I teach the third year operating systems course. And by the time people get there, a lot of people still don't have a lot of experience with debugging. And so I want to, since this is the first time I get 135 all to myself, um, I want you to start learning debugging on assignment one. So all of your assignments, the very first question is going to be a broken piece of code and I am going to ask you to fix it. This is actually going to be a very good thing for you because a lot of people, 99% of the people who come to my office for office hours, it's not people who don't understand the questions. It's people who have tried to solve the questions and Rackets giving them an error they don't understand or they're not getting the answer they, they expect. And they don't know how to approach finding the problem. So I want to give you that experience starting today and by the end of this course, you will have done so much debugging that you will know how to debug. And when you move on to future CS courses, if you decide to do so, you will have that basic debugging experience and it will help you. Debugging will make you a better programmer. You will understand Racket better. So the programs that I'm going to be giving you are on purpose broken in some way. Sometimes it's just going to be the documentation that's wrong. Documentation, that is the human readable stuff, has to match what the code actually does. Sometimes it's going to be the syntax. Maybe I forgot a bracket. Maybe I spelled something wrong. My keyboard on my laptop is actually broken, so anytime I push the letter C, I get either one or six of them. Yay, Apple. Good job. They know it's a problem, so they'll fix that keyboard for free, but how many times do I have to take it back to them? Um, so sometimes it's a spelling mistake or a syntax error, and sometimes it's a super tricky runtime error, where it's something like I divided by zero, or maybe when I was writing the code down, 
I misread the formula and I wrote the formula wrong, so I'm getting an unexpected result. So you're going to have to look at the code and try to figure out what's wrong with it, and then you are responsible for fixing it. And then we will make sure it does what it's supposed to do, and we'll check the documentation and so on and so forth. This is probably one of the most important things that we will do, is learning how to debug. Especially if you're going on to a co-op sometime in the future, and you're going to be working with other people, you have to make sure that your code is bug-free, and they might give you code that has bugs in it and ask you to fix it. That's the worst, by the way. Your, your co-worker's like, yeah, I've been working on this problem for the last month, and I don't know what's wrong with it. Can you look? Yeah, that's always great. Because no programmer, by the way, likes any other programmer's code. Every programmer thinks every other programmer's code looks terrible. Even my husband and I, we don't look at each other's code. It's like we, we've known each other for like decades, and it's like I will not look at his code, and he doesn't want to look at mine. Keep that separate. All right, so we have five expressions here, and none of them work. Why? So the first one, why does the first one not work? Okay, everybody's telling. <laughs> the order, it's an infix notation, and of course, racket only does postfix notation. What about the second one? What's wrong with it? We have parentheses are on the five. Those are extraneous, and racket will be like five is not a function, so that won't work. Uh, what about the third one? What's wrong with it? So that's one of the problems with it is we uh, have unbalanced bracket. What's the other problem in the white shirt back there? There's only one argument to add. Now the morning section is funny. I've never, I don't write broken code on purpose, so I didn't actually know what would happen if I had tried to add with only one argument. I mean, you could just give it that one argument. That would have been valid in my head. Uh, but yeah, racket will not let you have an add operator with less than two uh, arguments. So there are two problems with that one. Uh, what about the fourth one? What is wrong with that? Blue shirt. Yeah, that just makes sense, does it? Because uh, a function is not a, a number. So that doesn't work. What about the last one? That's division by zero. Now what's interesting about the last one is the four above it are what's known as syntax errors. Those are errors with your typing abilities. And believe me, the one you're going to encounter most in this course is unbalanced brackets. Yeah. Welcome to Scheme and Brackets. Unbalanced Brackets 101. Uh, this error, on the other hand, is syntactically correct. There's nothing wrong with that line of code. It is a runtime error. It is an error that occurs only during evaluation because we are trying to actually divide by zero, which we can't do. And it's not even that racket can't do it, it's that your CPU, that's what does the actual computation, can't do it. Those are the hardest to find. And actually, on that note, when we are working with code, how do we identify the fact that we have written a piece of code that is syntactically correct, but it's giving us the wrong value or some kind of ex uh, evaluation level error? Well, when you write code, every good programmer writes what's known as black box test cases before they write a single line of code. These are test cases that are testing the results produced by the function. So if I'm writing a function like add, but instead of passing to add you know, just two arguments, let's say I passed it a list. Think of it like a grocery list, and I want you to add everything in the list together. Well, how do I know when I write that add function that it's giving me the right answer? Well, what kinds of tests could I write before I even write the function so that when I do write the function, I know it's doing the right thing. Well, if I pass in a list that is empty, it should give me zero, because there's nothing in it. If I pass in a list of one item, it should give me the value of that item. We write those tests first. And then when we write our code and we run it, 
those tests should pass. And you should always be testing all of the corner cases. So how does it behave around zero? Negative values, positive values, and so on and so forth. It really depends on the function. There are other kinds of tests, by the way, and we'll get to the next class. But for today, those ones are very important. Um, so, and I do this, by the way. I write my tests first. And in fact, I write them on paper first, for the most part. You should never use the function that you're testing to give you the answer for your tests that you're comparing against. Because if your implementation's wrong, then the answers will be wrong, but your implementation will match your answer, so it thinks it's correct, but it's not. You figure it out on paper first. Now, admittedly, in my area where I'm working with graphics and film, that's a little hard. I can't put a firm frame on a piece of paper. But what I do do is I work the math out by hand. I'll say, I'm going to validate pixel 10 of the frame. And I work it out on paper for a particular image. I'll be like, OK, pixel 10 is green. I'm dropping the green component of the image. So pixel 10 should have value 0 at the end of my function. I will write all of those tests in advance on a piece of paper and work out all of the math and the solutions on a piece of paper first. And that will help me actually test and debug the fifth one's kind of error. We will talk more about the different kinds of tests that you have to write uh, later. Are tests required? From assignment two onwards, yes. You have to give us your tests. You don't really need them for assignment one, but I would highly advise that you do it anyways for assignment one for your own sanity and because it's good practice. Uh, now, if you're wondering, do they do this in industry? Uh, yeah, of course they do. Um, in industry, they will have large testing frameworks. They will have huge different test sets. And anytime anyone makes a change to the code and submits it, they will rerun the entire test bed again, and they call it regression testing. So it's every time you make a change to the code, we want to make sure that didn't break anything. So what you're doing here, and yes, I know it's, the amount of code you're going to write for the assignments is going to be about this much. The amount of documentation you're going to be writing on our assignments is this much. And you're going to be like, wow, this sucks. But they do it in industry too. There's a very good reason for it. Very good reason. So I know it might be a pain, but get used to it. And believe me, if you go back, you know, five years from now, oh, 135, I, what did I do in that course? You want to be able to look at your code and understand what you were doing, right? That would make sense. All right. Expressions are boring. I want to make my own functions. So how do I do it? It's quite easy, actually. A function in definition in Rapid has the following format. We have the name of the function, a list of parameters, which is separated by spaces, we have the body, which will be some kind of expression, and then a close bracket. Now, if I have a function f of x equals, I don't know, x squared, how does this translate into this? Here's the name. This is the parameters. This is the body. What about the equals? Well, does f of x equals x squared not telling us that the name f is bound to the fun expression x squared? Define is binding this name to this expression. I am defining function with name this, taking these parameters to this expression. And you can create all kinds of functions. So let's go over to Racket. 
If you want to define a function, you could, should do that in the upper window. That is the definitions window. So let's make a function. Let's suppose I want to create an add function that behaves just like real math and only takes two arguments. So we'll define add to take x and y. Like so. There we go. Now, in order for me to use this function that I've just created, what I'm going to have to do is I have to run it. And I know you probably can't see it because the icon's teeny, teeny, tiny. But in the upper right-hand corner, there's a run button. Hit run. And now, when you see this happy prompt with no error messages down below, it means your syntax is OK. You can now try to use it. How do I use the functions that I have just created? The exact same way you use any other function in Racket. Like that. Now, what happens if I pass my function to few arguments? You get a nasty error message. Add expects two arguments, but found only one. And if I tried to pass it to many arguments, I can anticipate getting an error message as well to make sure that you're doing things properly. Now, you can use the functions that you've defined in other functions. So I could then define another function below this. do that. And that's perfectly valid. And then I can call fun one on one and two, and I should get three. If you find your function body getting too big, ask yourself, is there any element of my function's body that I could extract and turn into a helping function? Keep your code simple. We'll talk more about helper functions another day. Any questions about the definition of a function? All right. So, what happens uh, from a pen and paper perspective for the evaluation of a function that you've created? Well, when I actually call function g and I pass into it 3 and 5, the first thing Racket's going to do is it's going to look at the arguments to the function and ask, are they values? If they are values, then we are good to do the substitution for function g. And in a single step, we will replace g3, 5 with the body of g where x and y have been filled in with the appropriate value. That happens in a single step. Now, if, however, our function, our parameters are not values, then Racket is going to have to perform the substitution and simplify the arguments prior to actually evaluating that function. So in this case, I have g, and my two arguments are g13 and f3. So neither argument is simplified. What does Racket do? Canonical form says leftmost innermost. So I'm going to look at I have two arguments to evaluate, two choices. I choose the leftmost one. So I'm going to evaluate this. Now looking at function g13, that is in its simplest form where the arguments are values. So I'm going to do an immediate single step substitution. I replace that with the body. And now I have plus one, three. That's one step. And the second step, I turn that into a four. And now, since this is a value, Racket moves on to the second argument and is going to simplify that one. And so in the next step, since this was x parameter was also a value, we replace f3 with its body, which is square three. 
and then in another step that turns into a 9, and now we can finally apply g to its parat arguments, and we get plus 4, 9, which leaves us 13. Make sure when you're doing these stepping problems that you do not leave out any steps. And only, I only do one step per line. All right. Any questions about that? Okay. When you create a function, and this is every beginning programmer's mistake, there's this temptation to, ah, I'm just using it once, I'm just doing it for this assignment, let's just call it eh. That's nice. So tomorrow when you wake up, you look at your code again and you're like, what the hell is F? What's that supposed to do? And if you look at it a year from now, you'll be like, wow, I have no idea what this does. It is absolutely mission critical that you give your functions meaningful names. F has no meaning. None at all. It's a letter. You want to make sure that the name that you give a function is something that actually indicates what that function is going to do. So if I'm trying to create a function that adds all of the elements of a list together, I might call it some list. Or if I write a function to try to find all of the people in this room currently wearing a red shirt, then I would call the function find the red shirts, send them out first. Sorry, that's a Star Trek reference. Now, you might be thinking, well, most functions are probably appropriately named. Experienced programmers know what they're doing. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> So I also, as I've mentioned many times, I teach the third year operating systems course, and we're using an operating system that actually was written at Harvard. And there is a function in the operating system called AS Activate. Seems like a meaningful function name, right? It activates this thing called an AS, which means address space. And so students, when they're creating address spaces, they think, oh, I better call AS Activate to make it live. Yeah, that's not what that function does. It doesn't activate shit. It doesn't do anything like that, even remotely. It is the single worst name function in the whole code base of like 25,000 lines. But because of its name, people call it thinking they need to. It's very important that the names you give your function actually mean something. You want your code to be readable now you want your code to be readable tomorrow, and you want your code to be readable by other people, which means the function names should indicate what that function actually does. Don't make the function names this long, because nobody wants to type that. Short, meaningful names are what you should be striving for. Uh, on the note of making function names too long, you might be thinking, oh, I could have a function this, function adds two numbers together and gives the result. Very meaningful. Great. No. I'm lazy, and so are your fellow programmers. We don't want to type that. And you know what else we don't want to do? I don't want to have to scroll to see the name of the function. In this course, we want you to only write code that is 80 characters wide. So you have to make sure that when you're giving meaningful names that they're not too long such that we can actually fit it on a line. No word wrap. I actually, so I've worked with this course for a long time. I haven't taught it since 2015, but prior to 2015, I actually used to be the TA for this course doing grading. You know one of the big things that I took marks off for students? Word wrap. Don't do it. Just don't. If you're using some editor other than Dr. Rack, and then don't blame me if you do, set the limit to 80 characters. Make a new line. Use proper indentation. All right. 
Now, let's look at parameter names. There's another thing that you need to make meaningful. Now, if you're doing just some math function, adds two numbers together. Well, you can't really give much meaning to those names because it's two arbitrary numbers. So in a math function, you might have x and y or a and b, and that's okay. But if I had a function that was supposed to operate on, let's say, a frame of a film, I should probably call those parameters film frame or maybe the frame ID or something like that. You need to make sure that the parameters to your functions also have meaningful names as well. You want your code, which is not English, to read like English. You want even your grandmother to be able to sit down and get an idea as to what's going on. I don't know, maybe your grandmother is one of these people who like invented COBOL or something, in which case, oh, can I learn it from them? Um, <laughs> it's like one of the only languages I don't know and haven't had a chance to work with is COBOL. Um, maybe, maybe someday I'll learn it. <laughs> but you want code to be readable. So it's important that not only does the function name be meaningful, but you need the parameter names to be meaningful as well. Now, how do we, ch what happens when we have parameters left? So here we have two functions, f and g. And function f takes parameters x and y, and g takes x and z. A lot of people ask, well, isn't this x this x? These two functions have the same parameter name. Isn't that a collision? It's not. Parameters only have meaning inside the body of the function. So this x only has meaning inside the body. This x only has meaning inside the body. These parameter names, x and z and x and y, have no meaning whatsoever outside the body of that function. No meaning. Likewise, we don't actually care what the names of the parameters are. So these two function definitions here, even though the names of the parameters are different, it's still technically the same function. Still the same thing. Your parameters can be named whatever you want, but they should be meaningful. And back when I used to grade the assignments for this course, I can't even tell you how many times I had students submit me assignments where their parameter names were A, 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 A. Like, I get it, maybe you're going for the obfuscated programmer of the year award, but I'm not reading that. If you haven't seen obfuscated programming contests, um, there are actual contests to see, can you write code that is so unreadable, nobody can tell what it does, and yet it works. Um, so people will have like a C program that looks like a pot of gold with coins in it, and it like plays a song. But looking at it, there's no, there's no way you can know. There's an actual contest. I'll post a link to it because it's really amusing. Please don't submit code that looks like that. Yes, it's funny. Your TAs will give you zero. <laughs> and also maybe like check in on you. Are you okay? All right. So we have functions. We know how to name them. We know about their parameters. We understand that parameters only have meaning within the actual body of the function. Um, one more thing that we need, and that's constants. So I work in computer graphics, and I say this all the time. Uh, we use the value pi all the time, because we're working with spheres and circles and arcs and all of those fancy things. So we use pi a lot. A lot of my programs that I write are over 25,000 lines of code, and a lot of them are that spread across hundreds of files. And I could, every time I wanted to use the value pi, I could actually use the straight up value, the literal value. So I could, I'll start on the first I'll be like, yeah, pi is 3.1415962. And then the next day I'm like, what did I use for pi in that other file? Oh, maybe it was just 3.1415, we'll use that in this file. And then a week later, I'm like, mm, pi is 3.14. So here's the problem. It's inconsistent. I'm inconsistent with myself. 
which means that I'm introducing errors into the system. And while in graphics we don't always care about that so much, it, maybe we do care. Maybe you're writing an application that does care about that, that loss of precision. But furthermore, what if the wonderful mathematicians up on the upper floors of this building finally discover that pi is actually just three? Life would be easier if it was just three. So if they discover it's just three, I've got to go back to my code, and I've got to open every single file and find where I put the number pi and replace it with a three. But here's the problem. Number one, I've got to open 100 files up and sift through 25,000 lines of code. Number two, since I was inconsistent about how I actually wrote it throughout the files, how am I supposed to know whether that was pi or that was some other special number I was using? It becomes impossible. So what we do is we create constants. For values that we're going to use more than once, we create constants for things that don't change very often. That means I am binding a name to a value in one place, and the advantage of doing this is that everywhere in my code where I want to use it, I refer to it by its name. So in all of my 25,000 lines, I refer to pi as pi. And then if pi does change, and its value is now 3, I only have to change it in one place. Just one place. And it automatically gets solved everywhere else. You need to use constants. They are very, very important. Not just in Racket, but in every programming language. You are going to lose marks if you don't use constants in this course. And that even goes for assignment one. We are expecting that you identify values which should be constants, and we are expecting that you turn them into constants. The format for a constant is define name value. It can also be define name expression, and Racket will evaluate the expression and bind the name to the value that the expression evaluates to. And now everywhere in your code, I could use K or P, and it would replace that with whatever value there was. That's pretty cool, right? There's no reason for you to lose marks over constants. Do them. Now you might be saying, okay, well, I'll just turn every number into a constant. And then they can't argue with me because I'm uh, saying I didn't create appropriate constants because I turned everything into a constant. Yeah, that's also stupid. Because if I have something like, um, this equation here, which is the area of a triangle, what am I gonna name that? Am I using it elsewhere? Yes, it's true. That's always going to be the area of a triangle. So technically speaking, the half is um, a magic number, and it's not going to change. So you might think it's appropriate to turn it into a constant. Actually, it's not really appropriate to turn it into a constant, because I can't think of a meaningful name for it. And I'm not going to use it anywhere else. And even if I did use the value half somewhere else, it would have a different meaning. So it's something like that I wouldn't turn into a constant. But let's suppose I wanted to, I don't know, do something like compute uh, my final grade. I'm going to write a function to compute my final grade, which is actually one of your assignment problems. Uh, for assignment one, that is. Well, each of the components of this course have a specific weighting. And I might have multiple functions involved with computing my final grade. That weight, which can change, though likely infrequently, but might be used in multiple functions, should be a constant. So the fact that assignments are worth 20%, 20% should be a constant known as assignment weight. And the fact that the exams are worth 75% should be a constant exam weight. If I was creating functions to work with the periodic table of elements, there's another example of something I might make into a constant, is the atomic weights of each of the elements. 
because those are not changing and I may use them in many functions. The cost per ounce of gold is another thing I might have as a constant. Yes, it does change. But I might use that value in many functions. Now, if we were doing this in another language, we probably would make this just an argument we pass into the functions. But you could make it also a constant as well. But magic numbers like this, the one half, you don't need to make that a constant. But do make sure on both your assignments and the exams that you create the constants as appropriate and name them appropriately. Now, when you see code that I have written, do not be surprised if you see the constant names written in all caps. That is a common convention in industry for constants to be, have their names all caps because it's a visual trigger to say, this is a constant. Whenever I see a name in all caps, I immediately know, constant. I don't even have to think about it. Yeah. One letter constants. Stuff for like E, that's appropriate because E is obviously, how else would you describe it? Uh, now, <laughs> and I mean C would kind of be appropriate as well because C is the speed of light and that's the, the letter that we usually use. Um, I might actually, instead of saying C for the speed of light, since that's not as commonly known as E, I would probably just use like speed of light. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, for assignment one, because we're asking you to implement some physics formulas, it's okay to actually leave the names of those constants as just G or E or C. That's okay. That's fine. Um, but in general, you like in industry programming, you may want to be a little more verbose about it. There's an other question at the back. Was that answered or? Okay, great. Another question there. So explain what you mean by a constant name that's not so obvious. Yeah, so A underscore weight, I mean, in the context of the code, that would make sense, but I would absolutely comment that. And in fact, whenever I make a constant, I also give a comment that gives a, a bigger description of what it is. Unless it's pi, which the name is pi, and it's kind of obvious what it is. But yeah, comments. By all means, yes, include them. Very important. All right, any other questions about these fun things? And by the way, you can also do really cool things in Racket. So let's make some constants over here. I can say, you know, define. I'm going to be bad. Let's give an example of bad names now. So define A to be 5. And then I can do define AA to be A, and I can define AAA to be AA. That's totally valid. You can do that. I mean, don't use those names. Those are like the worst names ever. Like, seriously. Like, if I was, if I didn't have a team of people smacking me over like, hey, you have to follow our grading scheme, I would like deduct marks from assignments if I saw that. Because that's like evil. And if I was your employer, I would fire you for names like that. But yeah, so we can do like AAA. Now, when you want to get the value of a constant, by the way, you don't need to put the brackets. You just type the name and push enter, and bracket will just return the value to you. One thing you cannot do is have two things with the same name in the same scope. Now, what does scope mean? So, let's go back to our slides here. So, if you have something at the top of your bracket file, that is, it's not enclosed in any other brackets, it has scope for the whole file, global scope. Scope means anybody at this level can use it. You could think of it as, the scope is this room, it's a giant box. And if I put an X in the middle of the room, any one of you who are also in the room could pick up the X and use it. Please don't. Uh, I want to say I don't own an X, but I do. <laughs> All right. Now, maybe 
each of these tables is enclosed in a box. And if there's an X in the room, well, since the box is in the room, anything in the box can use the X. But if inside the box there's a sword, only the people in the box can use the sword. The people outside of the box can't use the sword. They don't even know it exists. That's scope. If you're at the top, you can't see or use things that are in a more local scope. But if you are in the smallest box, you can see everything that's in the bigger boxes. So in this case, what we end up happening is we have a global scope constant named x. And I bound x to the value 3. And then I have a function f of x, f of x, y. But wait a minute, I have a collision. I have an x and an x. What happens? Well, what's going to happen in this program is x is not going to be free. We always take the definition from our local or innermost scope. So this x is actually the parameter x, not the global one. This is also a good reason for you to use unique, meaningful names for everything. Because if you use unique and meaningful names for everything, you should never have one of these collisions. And so you'll never have any confusion about it. Reason number 101 for making your code readable. All right. You cannot have two things with the same name defined in the same scope. What do I mean by that? So if I go back over to racket, I cannot, after defining A to be 5, I cannot then say A to be 6. I can't do that. And if I try to do that, Racket will tell me that A has been previously defined and we are not allowed to redefine it. Now, if you have been programming in C or C++ or anything other than Racket, you'd be like, yeah, but I could change the value of variables. Yeah, we're using functional programming here, and guess what? You can't change anything. Functions produce new values. That means if I'm making noodles and I want to put the water in the pot and I pass the pot, a pot to the function, the function does not return to me the original pot now with water in it. The function discards my pot and gives me a brand new pot with water in it. Functional languages, you can't modify things. And if you're sitting there, ah, but, but what about set bang? I can do it with set bang. Yeah, that's not pure functional programming. This is a course in pure functional programming, not cheats and hacks. So we can't change the value of a constant. And I can't change the elements of a list. I can only make new things. And we'll explain more about this as we go on. All right, any questions about that? All right. So then, if you are using Dr. Racket, which we highly recommend, it has a scope tool built in, which will help you see if you did do something such as use the name X for everything in your program, it will let you know exactly which meaning of X uh, has been taken on by its particular use. Do not get used to this functionality because it doesn't usually exist in other IDEs. This is a, uh, a fancy, fancy thing Dr. Racket is giving you. All right, now the remainder of these slides here are talking about what Dr. Rackin can do uh, and goals and so on and so forth. I'm going to let that be something you read on your own and I'm gonna call it quits here. And next class we'll start with module three, which is all the documentation you have to write with functions. All right, so go play video games or really I should be saying go do your assignment, right? And don't walk in front of that until I stop it.